Thank you, Mr. Prashan Bhatianatham, for your works, and welcome to each one of you to the edition of IBWBDA of this year. And right now, we are going to start with the session one. Uh, first, make sure that you're in the right session. Uh, this session is called Standardization of Biological Components. And uh, the first talk uh, is titled Network Visualization of Synthetic Biology Designs. Uh, which will be given by Matthew Cromther. Um, if you have uh, questions, you can ask them at the end of, the, of, of, each, uh, of each talk, uh, either by uh, the Zoom chat or to, in the Slack channel, or if you prefer, you can raise your hands on, on the Zoom to talk directly to the speaker. So please, uh, Mr. Matthew Cromther, you can start uh, anytime you want. Oh, thank you. Um, sorry, so I'm having to do this on my phone, so um, I think that's okay. Um, uh, can you see the screen okay? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Hi, right, so uh, this is my talk. It's around uh, design visualization via ne a network centric approach. Um, so before I begin, I just wanted to really talk about what network visualization actually is. Um, I'm going to go through just a, a pretty simple walkthrough of how uh, like biological statements that may be encoded within a design are uh, mapped into a visual uh, framework. So on the left will uh, be some simple data statements and then on the right will be these statements visualized. Um, so firstly, a really simple one, PTET is a promoter. Um, we can add this as a node on the screen. Um, that's pretty simple, but we must specify that this is also a promoter. Um, so we need a, another node um, connecting these two things. Um, and because we're saying that PTET is a promoter, um, we, had to, we have to add a directed edge to this, which means adding a, an edge with a, uh, an arrow on it. Um, and then the second one is PTET is constitutive. So we're saying that um, a, a property of um, PTET is that it's constituent to, oh God, it's constituently on. Um, so that's fairly simple. And then, but we can get to more complicated things. We can say things like PTET is a repressor. Uh, sorry, uh, PTET is repressed by TETAR. Um, so this means adding another protein like we did before. Um, but it's time, sorry, this time it's a protein rather than a promoter. Um, and then we, we can add a, repress an, a repression object, which means that rather than adding a physical thing, we're adding a conceptual thing, but the results are still the same. And then um, finally, we just have to add edges between these things. So we're saying that Teta is, uh, it represses PTA. Um, yeah. Uh, and then finally, um, one more, uh, tetracycline inhibits TETA. And this is much of the same. Um, we add a new object and then we add arrows between these things. Um, so this was a really basic overview of what network visualization is, but as we'll see later on, it will be a little bit more in depth. Um, so before I start to talk about our work, uh, I want to talk about why we decided, we identified network visualization. Um, I'm going to talk about three reasons why we found just the network approach useful for biodesign visualization. So firstly, uh, networks are dynamic and thus the network visualization is also dynamic. So with current uh, static representations of data, we can only really get one insight at one level of detail. But with network visualization, we can view a num we can view the data in a number of different ways and also a, a number, a, a different level of detail. Um, and the next is scalability. So as designs are becoming larger and larger, as, as, uh, contemporary techniques, might, it might become difficult to comprehend simply due to extreme size. So, but with this sort of visualization, um, complexity can be simplified using a number of established techniques that are already um, which have already got a, a, quite a lot of years of research behind them. And then finally, as uh, Symbio moves towards automation, the manual specification and manipulation of, um, 
of data becomes unfeasible. But with network visualization, we can fully automate this stuff at scale and it's relatively computationally cheap. So we could, in theory, integrate this stuff into the design build test learn cycles to produce at a glance views of specific data outputs. Um, so moving on to actually our solution, um, I'm going to provide a really quick brief overview of what our, our proposed solution um, by bringing back that little example from the second slide. Um, even though it's very trivial, some of the changes might seem redundant, um, but I think as I, as I show some overviews of some more complex designs later on, um, it'll be, become clearer why these are useful. So going back to our design with no changes, um, the first thing that we do in our pipeline is we decide what the view is. So the view is a, a process of modification and aggregation of the underlying data to focus on a specific aspect of a design. So we go back to our example. Um, we want, say if we want to just look at what, what are the interactions between things in the design, we can aggregate the data to create a much simpler um, view. Uh, all this is, is it aggregates all the interactions into a single edge and also removes any unwanted data. Um, next, we move on to layout. Layout is just a physical layout of the visualized network on screen. And this is done by providing nodes with coordinate values. Um, so with this example, it's a little bit contrived because it's very trivial, but the layout doesn't change much, but we can actually <clears throat> move nodes left to right based on input output. Um, and then finally comes a number of different changes, um, all designed to encode data without simply adding extra nodes, which clutter up the screen and make things look more complicated. So for example, when we produced a view before, the types of the nodes were removed. So we didn't know what, what any, we lost, there was data loss. But instead of re-adding those nodes, we can add color um, to denote these, this, this different information. And this results in, in my opinion, a much simpler output. So we can do a quick comparison between the input and the, out, and the final uh, output. And we can, I think we can see a, a marked simplification even in this fairly trivial design. Um, like I said, this was a fairly uh, simple overview of what we're doing, but we can produce many unique paths. And when this is, this is scaled up, I think the advantages to this sort of thing become more apparent. So as we can see from this image, there's three completely unique visualizations and they're all produced from the same design. So for example, at the top is the interaction graph, like we talked about previously in the example. Um, the second one is the hierarchy of physical parts and conceptual groupings. And then at the bottom, there's um, relationships between modules and, and crossover and things like that. But these are just three examples of potential um, routes through this and what um, actually what we want to visualize. The app, it's, a, it's an arbitrary number really, whatever we want to visualize it, it is in theory possible with this. Um, so in conclusion, I think that network visualization can be a powerful tool for biodesign automation and primarily due to the, key, the three reasons that I discussed at the start, it, that network visualization is robust enough that it can target an arbitrary number of insights based on users' needs. It can scale with the increasing size of biodesigns and it is inherently automatable. Um, so the work that we've done at the moment is, um, is only a small part of what we're planning to do. As we look to broaden this research, we're gonna look into some more topics. So one that I'm really interested in is looking at, is not only looking at design, but also other aspects of the uh, design build test learn and also the Symbio projects as a whole. So this could look at visualizing experimental data how experimental data is integrated and also seemingly totally different things like maybe robotics protocols. Um, so even though we've successfully visualized relatively large designs, we haven't tested it with extreme size designs. So maybe chromosome scale designs. This, I think this could be a key point where this type of visual visualization stands out. And then finally, we've only really explored a small subset 
Um, I think this last point is really saying we just want to expand what we've already done um, and, and produce more opportunities for insight. And combined with this, when we've been producing these sort of intermediate graphs, these views, um, we, we've found some success in applying certain graph theory techniques um, to these intermediate graphs. And potentially at some point, this work could start looking as well as visualization, but also some sort of enhancement and integration challenges. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, appreciate it. Um, so um, I don't know how, have I got, how long have I got left? Um, Hello. Sorry, yeah, I think this is about uh, roughly five minutes. Okay, will I have a chance to play like a two minute video or do you think that'll be pushing it? Absolutely, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so like I said, I had to use my phone for this, but so the text is, you can't read the text, but I just wanted to show a quick video of my, um, of the tool that we've been working on combined with this. Um, so I'm just going to play this. It's pre-recorded with my voice in. So um, I'm just going to play it now anyway. Hi, so this is the tool in part of the talk. Um, I'm going to be as brief as possible because I'm concerned that I might be running out of time. If anybody has any questions or feedback, uh, feel free to get in contact with me. So the example design that we're going to be using is a simple null gate. Um, it's mainly just to show off the tool rather than the other way around. So when the tool's loaded, we're presented with the raw, raw visualization of the data. Um, not much can be gauged from this at this point until we make modifications. Like I said, because of the time constraints, I'm only going to go over a single preset. All these presets are, are single paths through this pseudo pipeline that we discussed previously. The preset that I'm going to explain is visualizing interactions. Um, the view is of nodes denoting physical entities and edges are the interactions between these entities. It's a really simple um, aggregation process. Um, it basically removes unwanted data and then aggregates interactions into single edges. The layout's a force-directed algorithm. It's a physics-inspired algorithm that repels nodes based on how connected they are to one another. But it allows for an intuitive visual output where inputs and outputs of these interactions are clearly seen. We then add uh, some color. So for nodes, this denotes the role of the physical entity and types is the type of interaction. Although the design's relatively simple, I still think that the intent behind the design is easy to understand. But we can actually take this a little bit further and we can apply transitive closure algorithms and all combined with the knowledge of the data model, we can apply a scaling abstraction. So if I click this here, we've got the same view, but a different level of abstraction. So we've increased the abstraction by finding the transitive relationships of only genetic objects. We, by doing this, we can create a simpler view while encoding the same shape and intent. We can actually take this step one further um, by looking at only proteins, using the same process, but only with proteins. This produces a really compact graph, which removes much of the granular detail, but the intent is still encoded, even at a glance. And just a final view, we can look at something which is very verbose, a, a really uh, non-abstract graph. This is essentially a raw representation of the encoded data within the design with no modifications applied. This sort of low abstraction might seem a little bit pointless, but it can be useful for things like um, multi-input, multi-output, um, interactions and things like that, things that have been lost with the more abstract representations. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so that's me done. Thanks for listening again. Um, thank you. Um, okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, there is time for uh, just one question. Um, is a tool available anywhere to try out yet? Um, 
Yes, I believe in the abstract, I've got a link to the software. Um, but if anybody um, is struggling getting it working, because it is still fairly early on, if uh, get in contact with me, honestly, I'd love any collaboration or anything like that. Um, but to answer the question, it is on, um, it is on, it is on the paper. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, and we are going to move on to the next talk, um, which is a data representation in the DARPA SD2 program. Uh, in, uh, it will be given by Dr. Jacob Bill. So um, Mr. Jacob Bill, you can start in any, if you wish. All right, uh, is my screen share coming across okay? Yes, we can see it clearly. Excellent. So um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I'm uh, giving a talk here today on behalf of a whole bunch of different folks from a number of different organizations uh, to give a retrospective on uh, what happened um, around the areas of biodesign automation and especially data representation within this program that DARPA was running for the past few years called the DARPA SD2 program. So let me start by introducing what this was all about. Uh, <clears throat> the DARPA SD2 program was um, tackling complexity challenges in scientific research in an area of you know, cloud um, automation, laboratory automation, uh, big data, et cetera. And a major focus of it was synthetic biology. So there are three key challenges that uh, they're thinking about tackling that many of us in the program were involved with. One is um, you know, sharing um, across and within organizations, um, sharing data, sharing designs, uh, sharing insights, sharing all the different artifacts um, and intermediates within scientific research as we do in complex collaborations. A second is a huge major friction point right now is that just because you have data doesn't necessarily mean you can analyze that data because you need to be able to figure out how the rows and columns in your data table relate to the things that went into the experiment and how the experiment was conducted and what were the hypotheses and so on. So this process of integrating to make data ready to analyze uh, can actually be a vast amount of the friction in a scientific project entirely. And it limits our ability to collaborate effectively. Um, and a third is if we want to take advantage of automation as is very important in complex domains like synthetic biology, we have to be able to um, agilely and effectively integrate pipelines, workflows, teams, et cetera. So right now, the way that things typically work in synthetic biology is that you have this sort of very siloed collaboration. I'm using a couple of images that they used in the program where you have this idea that sort of something happens in the lab and then they toss it over the wall to the data scientist over here who's only seeing some small pieces of the puzzle. Uh, there's a huge amount of um, loss of data and metadata integrity due to the manual handoffs where just things don't get communicated, not because anybody's trying to hold anything back, but because we're working with very complex artifacts and systems. So everything gets bottlenecked on the communication. It's very expert intensive. It's a very high cognitive workload. And <clears throat> you know, because information doesn't really get uh, centralized or shared effectively, um, everything works much more slowly and we're limited in the size and complexity of our collaborations. So this program that DARPA was running, Synergistic Discovery and Design, over the past four years, it, <clears throat> it just wrapped up this summer with some follow-ons going on, is a fairly big uh, program with more than 100 researchers from more than 20 organizations, most of whom were working on synthetic biology, <clears throat> although there were some chemists as well. Um, and Unusually for a program this large, um, all of the folks in there needed to work together and nobody was in charge of organizing them to work together. Um, they sort of threw us into the deep end to try to get to a place where we could uh, figure out how to self-organize leveraging tools to uh, <clears throat> be able to make everything 
much more integrated and connected with the data supporting automation, communication, uh, separation of concerns, et cetera. So one of the real keys to making all this happen is representation, representation of knowledge, of uh, data, of metadata. Because the representations that you're working with very much constrain what types of organizations and workflows you are able to put together. The sort of default way in which we work is bilateral relations. That's a fancy word for saying that um, when two people want to collaborate, they put together an ad hoc means of talking to each other. They sort of work their way into a shared language and communication patterns. It's very costly, very time consuming. You've got to have the experts spending a lot of time talking to each other to develop their particular shared understanding and shared language on one of these links. And now when you want to talk with another organization, you've got to start from scratch all over again, building another ad hoc relationship. So when we're talking about larger collaborations, typically that collapses into um, a second pattern, what, what we call the command and control pattern, where essentially one party ends up dominant and uh, has a sort of coercive standards um, that you can get things going back and forth in representation on everybody else, between all your different people, but you're very limited in flexibility, limited in extensibility, and essentially you've got one single point of failure um, in that organization. Where we're trying to move to here, um, and what we worked on over the course of the SD2 program, was a model that breaks these two paradigms with a flexible rendezvous model where you have a general enough representation for a shared data store where you can have these distributed standards that let information flow track the relationships as they evolve. So you've got a standard that means that when two people want to have a conversation, they just need to figure out how to map what they want to talk about data and experiment and synthetic biology design wise into your shared representation and how to read that representation rather than negotiating from scratch. And because it's a flexible distributed representation, you're not in this uh, Procrustean bed where it's very hard to do a new project. So the center of all of this for us working on this within SD2 ended up being SBAL. Um, at the start of the program, um, you know, SBAL wasn't able to do everything that we needed. At that point, uh, SBAL 2.1 uh, was out. It was really very focused primarily on genetic design. Um, and it, there was still the sort of awkward split between talking about structure of designs versus talking about uh, you know in, in component definitions versus module definitions that talked about function. Uh, there are a lot of limitations on the representation at that time. And as we've tried to work with SBAL in the full design build test loop within this program, um, work in this pragmatic environment has been one of the drivers of SBAL development over the past few years. By far not the only one, but one of a number of forces that have been driving SBAL towards generalization across a much larger portion of the design, build, test, learn workflow. So across the past few years, SBAL moved um, you know, from 2.1 to 2.2, 2.3, and finally uh, version three, which uh, you'll hear the workshop on from the SBAL community today, and I'm one of the folks uh, helping run that. That covers a much broader area of, you know, not just um, you know, genetic designs, but talking about consortia, multicellular systems, media, samples, all across the design, build, test, learn workflow. So you can talk about how the designs uh, of your genetics represent to what you want to do with your strains, uh, relate to what you want to do in the design of your experiment, relate to the samples and replicas you got in the lab, relate to the data, relate to the models that you pulled out of that data. Um, <clears throat> with the move to SBAL3, we also were able to make everything much simpler, uh, better able to be integrated with external databases. Um, and 
<clears throat> uh, with some additional um, uh, upgrades with ontologies and such have been able to even um, allow direct compilation of the representation into library code, which reduces uh, the uh, rate at which we're, we inject bugs through uh, implementing things by hand. Uh, there's also been some key accelerants uh, in terms of um, the implementation of specifications themselves. Let me hop forward a little here toward that. Um, so as I said, SBAL3, one of the major things that's happened over the past two years in the SBAL community and SD2 has been one of the key influences um, on that through the pragmatic challenges. One of the other tools that we ran into uh, that we ended up developing here is this tool called SBAL Factory. And I've dropped a link here uh, where you can uh, go hunt it up. Um, one of the challenges that we uh, have often found is that the time to go from negotiating what you want a, a representation to be to being able to actually start experimenting with it was often long and things would get out of sync between uh, libraries and between tools, partly because it would take weeks to months to go from here's what we want to do to now I have uh, code that actually means that we can start experimenting with this. Uh, SBAL Factory um, is a tool that uh, Brian Bartley led the development of uh, that goes directly from, um, a, <clears throat> uh, from an ontology into an SBAL based um, Python data representation in a few seconds. Uh, so we generate the code for the library so you can go straight from experimentation on a branch to working with things to get a much better sense of is this representation developing in the way that I need to even before you finish deciding is this the one that I want to use. Another key piece of figuring out how to better integrate with um, external systems, there's this, all these wonderful ontologies out there and they're a pain to work with because typically uh, if I want to talk to an ontology, I need an opaque URI. Like if I want to use the, the NCI thesaurus uh, word for strain, I need to remember that that's NCIT C95501. <laughs> and media is C19442. Having these you know, globally unique URIs is a very good thing. The fact that they are these numerical URIs, there's a good reason for that for the most part, because it means that they can change the wording um, and more easily. But these are not human friendly. Uh, this Taito uh, piece of software, uh, you know, also a uh, you know, nice little support from Brian, makes it way easier to do that because it just sucks the ontology in and turns it into um, a bunch of Python variables if you're working in Python. Um, you can also look up terms of, <coughs> uh, from URIs and vice versa. So there's a whole bunch of useful bits and pieces for simplifying your relationship with ontologies. So I. I never want to see SO000167 again. I just want to call it a promoter and have all my tools be very easily able to tell it a, that this is a promoter. So on the basis of these underlying foundational tools for making our interaction with the representations easier, we built a whole bunch of different pieces of tooling for connecting together all the different stuff. So our typical world in a lab is, you know, we've got some designs over here, maybe they're in Benchling, maybe they're in Snapgene, maybe they're in Ape, maybe they're just in Excel. Uh, we've got a Word document somewhere, if we're lucky, that's, uh, you know, got so, uh, some natural language prose about what experiment we wanna do. And then these are just totally unconnected from when we go and, and actually run things in the lab and get our data and metadata and wanna try and do analysis. Our analysis needs to take the data and metadata, but it also needs to get hooked up to these things, which are usually just totally disconnected. So across the course of the SD2 program, uh, we ended up building a whole lot of different little pieces of tools um, all centered around um, SBAL and integrating uh, a lot of the integration through us through SynBioHub. Um, <clears throat> and 
adding some other pieces like uh, you know, these build requests that makes all of this um, fully integrated. I'm gonna talk about some of these key pieces that we worked on. So one of the first pieces that we put together here was something that we called the project dictionary, which is just about uh, coming to an agreement on what we're calling the things we're talking about. You may have, if you've you know worked in a lab for long, you'll notice everybody has their own shorthand. What I call L arabinos, you call A uh, on your you know shorthand note or A plus uh, because you're saying yes, I put arabinos in or era or L era or L arab or L arabinos or this Chebby ID or this completely opaque limbs ID in your inventory system that it's really R72349 because that's what the label of the flask is in the inventory system and decoding this is really painful and typically makes this interpreting the metadata associated with an experiment a very difficult and manual process. So we put together a simple spreadsheet interface actually just based in Google Sheets uh, with a back end talking to it uh, that let us harmonize terminology across organizations. Essentially, this just um, looked at the sheet, looked at SynBioHub and synchronized uh, the SBAL entries in SynBioHub with the entries in the sheet with plus some extension information about aliases uh, associated with different labs. Uh, so that uh, greatly simplified the amount of pain that was associated in um, linking up these different pieces of automation around construct design, experiment planning, um, you know, loading in the data, analysis, etc. And one of the things that we saw across the course of the program from the launch of this um, in mid uh, 2018 was that um, over time, the set of entries in the dictionary had a very steady increase. Uh, so showing that not only was it being used, but it was being used for more and more different things that people wanted to talk about. It wasn't just that we established one vocabulary and then people worked in that little project. The other thing that was interesting is um, we could actually directly quantify how much collaborative sharing of information there was, as opposed to um, just information about um, you know, one lab's use of automation. Because we could look at how many terms had multiple lab aliases associated with it. Uh, <clears throat> and over time, the amount of sharing that was going on uh, enabled at least in part by the use of this dictionary uh, where multiple labs were, were using uh, terms uh, increased dramatically. Leveraging this, another of the key pieces that we built was this system called Intent Parser. This is for figuring out what the heck you mean in that experiment plan you're writing. Uh, typically, your experiment plan gets basically written in, in prose and there's a lot of back and forth when you're talking about what you want to do lots of opportunities for mistakes and confusion. So again, we went to the uh, to the cloud well, rather than Google Sheets, uh, we uh, put the interface in Google Docs, uh, added a you can you can put a plug in that adds a menu. Uh, and the intent parser menu, uh, let us uh, do um, automated as automation assisted linking to the machine readable uh, definitions in SynBioHub so that you know, when you wrote down A plus in your table, you could link that actually this goes to the entry for El Arabinos. Um, a table-based design of um, all the key parameters for an experiment as well. And then we actually connected this with the experiment providers APIs in here. We um, most especially will work with Stratios, who some of you may remember at, by their old name of Transcriptic as well. Um, <clears throat> so we could actually, um, suck out of their API, what are the protocols on offer, and then uh, set up a pre-configuration of like, here are the parameters you need, here are the constraints that we know, and then be able to do a pre-flight validation of, is this experiment plan going to be able to run at Stratius? Is this, um, yeah, is this protocol gonna be okay with what you're asking for? And then directly submit it and initiate the experiment right there from inside of a Google Doc. Once we got this out and running, um, it got used for the majority of all of the experiments that were run. And in fact, this is the vastly dominant majority 
of all of the experiments that could have been run by it, because some of the groups were doing things that um, you know, did not have um, a lab that we could do submissions to this through, like the chemists. Spoke some about SynBioHub, another of the key things that happened, and I think you'll hear about one of these plugins shortly, um, is uh, making SynBioHub more readily customizable with a system of plugins. Um, another related uh, <coughs> thing was making it easier to upload genetic library designs. Um, as I said, you're, you're about to hear a talk about this as well. Um, so I'm not going to go into this, but you know, the general idea is that a lot of times it's much easier to have a biologist author something in Excel. And there's been uh, large volumes of designs that have been authored and uploaded through this at this point. Another of the key representational challenges we ended up tangling with was that um, just because somebody has designed something in, you know, Benchling or whatever, just because you've got a GenBank file for a strain doesn't mean that it's any good or that it has the information you need. Um, <clears throat> There's a lot of very dirty genetic designs out there that are not automation susceptible. So one of the things that this Synbict synthetic biology curation tool does um, is it uh, essentially recurates the information that's already in a design. The other thing is because most people are working in stuff like uh, you know Benchling, Snapkin, you know, other things that produce GenBank and just can't encode interaction information effectively is that almost all designs you come with are lacking information on interactions. But a lot of time, well, how you want to interpret the designs when you're doing data analysis is all about the interactions. So uh, this uses a, uh, <clears throat> a library-based approach to search for, identify, and add interaction information into an SBAL model of a design. And uh, within SD2, uh, you know, this was run uh, at, across a whole bunch of strains, uh, more than 100 strains, and had 91% success rate at being able to identify and add regulatory information. One last tool I'll mention here uh, is a tool called Redoer. Uh, this Redoer stands for Re Reverse Design of Experiments. And the Redoer system um, this is really a debugging tool more than anything else. When you get a data set in, if it's badly curated, um, it may not be good for analysis and you may not know this until you're trying to analyze it. Uh, so you spend a lot of time trying to debug what's in a data set, perhaps even chasing down um, you know, a long time, you know, weeks or months of time wasted because you've been analyzing the wrong data. Uh, because your metadata was all screwed up. So what Redoer does is it looks at the descriptions of all the samples that you've got, and it tries to figure out what sort of experiment might you've been trying to do. So it may look at um, you know, a bunch of samples which are varying in their arabinose dose and say, oh, this is a one-factor experiment that's it's got some controls over here, and it's looking at what happens to this system when I make variation of arabinose dosage over there. And oh, look, it's a nice smooth series. That's sensible. And when it finds things that don't make sense, like, oh, that seems like it's a really big gap. You know, so it goes from one to 51 to 53. That's kind of a weird spacing. People usually don't design experiments for like that. Then it'll flag it. Or if it can't figure out how things come together. And this turned out to be really useful for us because it let us find out lots of problems before they went into the analysis. If a machine can't make sense of what sort of um, <clears throat> experiment you're trying to do, that's a red flag that's worth taking a look at. Um, oh, I see a question in the chat, by the way, from uh, uh, Michael Galziki saying, when you run into an error, how do you know what to correct? Um, you know, when possible, we are in fact able to tell you something like say, you know, you ask for temperature, uh, you know, 53, but, um, you know, we have, this protocol can only be run with temperatures up to 40 Celsius. So whenever possible, we, when, when a validation error happens, it's associated with a rule that was extracted from the API that gives us information we can uh, send back. Um, 
And uh, in the response to the question about does Redoer have provenance information, in this case, um, it happens to not be working directly with provenance, it's just working directly with the, with the table of uh, metadata. So the total results here was that these tools um, appear to be um, closely correlated with increases in sharing that uh, correlated in turn with increases in data production rates. Uh, so we accumulated a vast amount of, of uh, data in the SynBioHub triple store over the uh, course of this, about 23 million triples, including a huge number of components, um, lots of modules, lots and lots of collections. Uh, and interestingly, some of the key milestones in the tools uh, corresponded with key with points where we saw increases in knowledge sharing and productivity. And the sort of the key things I want to uh, leave you with here, what we've been able to extract um, is that in the second half of the program, essentially after all this stuff started coming online effectively, uh, we saw that a very close correlation between the rate of experimentation going uh, up much faster. Uh, so the whole first uh, part of the program, uh, the whole first two years of the program, gave about 100 experiments, and the two years after that uh, gave about 200 experiments. And the rate at which dictionary entries were added, indicating expansion of new collaborations, uh, is uh, closely correlated here, as you can see on this graph. And then looking at some of the key points of types of data stored in SynBioHub, uh, we saw jumps tightly correlated with uh, the specific points in time when uh, tools were introduced. So these are only correlations. They're not necessarily causations, but they reflect the anecdotal descriptions from the users as well. So where are things are going from here? Program's over, but uh, the tools are out there. Uh, <clears throat> all the tools that I talked about are publicly available on GitHub under free and open licenses. Uh, so uh, the core SBAL related tools you can find um, in the SBAL organization um, and other tools are uh, contained in this SD2 organization. Uh, and the sort of high level conclusion that you know, we took out of this is that representational tools are really foundational for getting your workflows together. And if you want free and open synthetic biology workflows that we can all share as a community, then we need to make sure we have free and open tools like these. These are not necessarily the right tools or the end of the story. Like anything, as you work on it, you discover better ways to do it. Um, but try using these tools as you can and improve and contribute your own tooling. And together, we may get to where we'd like to be. All right, I see one other question. I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, uh, <clears throat> You have a sense of the amount of reuse of experimental data or components throughout the program. Um, so the experimental data, the data itself that came out uh, tended to get reused very heavily uh, because people were comparing back and forth um, you know, across uh, data series in order to try to understand things that they were studying in order to look back at controls, et cetera. So the data got reused and aggregated very heavily. And there are publications in process um, on things that were accomplished from that. Uh, the components, some of the components got reused very heavily, especially some of the more core strains. Um, others were very much one and done. Um, so a lot of the a lot of the core materials, you know, media, et cetera, um, very heavily reused. Other things, not so much. We haven't attempted to quantify it yet though. Thank you, good question. All right, and now I will stop talking and hand it off to Yet. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jacob Bill, for your presentation. It was very interesting. We don't have uh, no more time for more questions, so we are going to move on to the next presentation, uh, which is data, which is, sorry, Excel S SBL converter creating SVO from Excel templates and vice versa. Um, if, um, this, this presentation is, is given by Julian A. 
I am and Janet Mains. So you can start in anytime you want. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this presentation regarding the Excel to SQL converter. So today um, we'll be going over the background of SQL to Excel, as well as an example conversion, uh, the code architecture, and then a further work regarding this tool that we've been creating. So firstly, um, generally not all wet lab biologists know how to use SPL. Um, when they want to use a lot of these biological tools, it can be a bit confusing because they don't have as much technical experience with them. Along with that, um, SPL to Excel converter is, um, it's created to simplify a lot of workflows for biologists as well. On top of that, uh, this tool is designed to increase the user friendliness of SynBioHub. And overall, uh, spreadsheets are also easy to use and they're already part of the workflow. So we're just adding to uh, that model that has been pretty used consistently. So the process is we see user one, they will have an Excel file and they can take that Excel file, put it through Excel to SBOL. And then from Excel to SBOL, um, you get an SBOL file, which goes to user two. And user two is able to take their SQL file, put it through SQL to Excel, and get it back to user one in an Excel file. And here we we have a representation of how the um, conversion model is supposed to look. Um, so looking at an example conversion, there are several different temp Excel templates you can fill out uh, with the component information. Um, they vary a little bit based on uh, the columns that are there, um, which might, depending on your workflow, the kinds of information you want to give might be different. Um, so this is an example of a filled out uh, template. Um, can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay. Yes, we can okay. see it. Um, so up here um, is information about the collection as a whole, um, and then this is the list of parts. So each row here um, is a component um, and the information about it. Um, this gets converted by uh, the tool to XML, uh, the S uh, XML representation of SBOL, uh, which can then be uploaded to SymbioHub. Here we see an output of how um, SBOL to Excel is supposed to look. Um, as you know, we go from the XML file and the output we see here that we have for our columns, the identity, part name, role, design notes, part description, and source organisms that we extracted from the XML file. Um, so we wanted to look a little bit at the general architecture of how these tools actually work. Um, to see, I get to show how they've been designed to be further expandable. Um, so with Excel to SBOL, um, first the uh, different areas of the template are read in. Um, so there's the collection information that you can give a general design description, and then there's the table of parts. Um, then an SBOL document is created. We use Pi SBOL. Um, and the metadata um, for the collection is used to set document properties. Um, then we work through each row in the part information table and look at every column um, to process uh, the components. We use this special sheet, um, which actually tells the processor how to convert the uh, column into an SBOL compliance property. Um, the first step is on the right. You can see there's this sheet lookup idea, um, which is looking at uh, if a human readable term was used, uh, converting that into the SO term. Um, so for example, here we're going from column B to C uh, on the ontology sheet, um, as was indicated on this slide using the ontology sheet and B to C. 
Um, alternatively, there's also the replacement lookup type, um, which again, you are given uh, a sheet and a, a to and from column. Um, so in this case, uh, replacement lookups have a prefix, colon, and a suffix. The prefix is used in the from column, and then the suffix is put in the replacement. Um, the Once these terms have been converted from uh, human readable to ontology terms, we then look at uh, the way a particular column should be processed. Um, so there is an SBOL term, um, and then there's the namespace URL. Um, there are three general ways of processing this. If the SBOL term given is not applicable, uh, the column is just passed over. Uh, this might be things you don't want to add into SBOL or things that you do want to add, but want to add uh, in a compounded column. So you might have two columns which you use to do some kind of sum and use only put in a third column um, into the SBOL. Um, the second option is a predefined method. Uh, so, for example, SBOL role circular is predefined. Um, it specifically looks at adding the term circular to um, the list of roles that the component has. Uh, and there are a few of these for the most common things we expect to see. Um, there is also the option of an unknown method. So if there is no predefined method, uh, there is a standard fallback. Um, which adds the cell value as a text annotation in the namespace given in the namespace column. Um, finally, the SBOL document is written out um, and can then be used further. Um, in general, the um, all of the functions are called within a single converter function. However, there are then special classes uh, looking at um, the conversion of the columns, the reading in of the table, uh, and the outputting of the table. So with the SBOL2 Excel process, um, firstly, we choose a template that you want to put the SBOL information to. And so here we see that we have a template and generally you'll have like we have here, the columns, part name, role, design notes, alter sequences, et cetera. And this template, of course, is supposed to be blank because you want to take the information from your SBOL sheet and output it into this uh, spreadsheet, into this as well as spreadsheet. And then secondly, uh, we'll read in the SBOL XML document and we'll iterate over the uh, component definitions in order to extract the information that we're looking for. So here we have an example of the XML file. So we have the component definition, uh, we have was generated by, was derived from sequence, and uh, we'll take information out of here to put into our spreadsheet. So thirdly, we will take the parts and put them into a dictionary. And then from that dictionary, we'll store the parts into a pandas data frame. Fourthly, we will set each of the component definitions to a row and we'll set the properties as the columns. So with these specific properties, we have some post-processing that goes on first. And here's some examples for sequence, organism, and no change. Uh, one specific one is with sequence. So if we have a URI that exists, then we obtain the sequence string from the SBOL, doc, SBOL object and add as a column row or as a column value to the sequence row. And the purpose of this post processing is just to make the information that we're extracting a lot more human readable. Fifth, we will reorder the list of columns based on the given list of column names. So here we have an example of an input list. So we have an input list of identity, part name, and role. And then we have the columns given to, or the columns within the actual SQL file, the role, part name, part description, and type. So the output order that we'd like to take is the part name, the role, the part description, and the type as our final uh, output within the Excel spreadsheet. 
six, I will take this uh, final data frame and we will output it into Excel. And we see here, we have information that we extracted from the SVL uh, file. And we have within our columns, the identity, part name, role, et cetera. And then um, within our rows, we have the properties associated with the um, component definitions. And here, we also have the model architecture and we have uh, overall one converter function that handles uh, the calling of every other function. And generally these are these all work together to make sure that the um, data frame is properly output into our Excel spreadsheet. Um, so future work. Uh, there are still some current limitations with um, both the Excel to SBOL and SBOL to Excel. Um, so dealing with multiple values of the same property, um, both in the case where uh, converting both ways, if you have uh, one several columns using the same SBOL property or several of S uses of the same SBOL property, so for example, several roles, um, this can lead to overwriting uh, and only the last one uh, being put into SBOL or Excel as uh, the case may be. Um, additionally, in Excel to SBOL, uh, currently any other columns are simply added as text annotations, uh, and we would like to work on using either URI uh, or text as is appropriate based on the cell value. Uh, further work, so currently the, all the ontologies in uh, Excel to SBOL uh, are in a separate sheet, and um, in SBOL to Excel, we pull in um, a special Excel spreadsheet with the ontologies. Um, we're working to instead incorporate Taito, which Jake Beal was talking about earlier, um, to make that uh, more flexible uh, and updatable. Um, additionally, we're looking at what is the core metadata. So we have an initial set of columns proposed, um, but looking at exactly what people would want to encode. So if you have uh, any ideas about general use of Excel to SBOL or SBOL to Excel and what you would like to see, please do let us know. Um, we're working towards SBOL 3 compliance. At the moment, everything is still in SBOL 2. Um, we're working on plugins. So at the moment, there is an Excel to SBOL um, SymbioHub plugin. So if you upload uh, an Excel a filled out template to SymbioHub, you can select the Excel to SBOL plugin uh, and it will simply upload it uh, as SBOL, which you can then download as needed. Um, we're still working on the opposite where the you can download SBOL from SymbioHub as an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and finally, we're working towards the integration of more top level SVL types. Uh, at the moment, we are limited to component definitions, but we would like to expand to modules, experiments, uh, etc. Um, and yeah, these are our funding sources and lots of people uh, worked with us. Um, I saw a question. Um, Oh, I think that's been answered already about the uh, user friendliness. So hopefully plugins also make that more user friendly. Um, and for Goxel um, about the namespace URLs, um, that uh, sheet um, with the columns and the namespace URLs uh, is actually a separate sheet that is hidden and as user you don't need to see. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, there is a one, one question. Uh, are there, um, sorry, um, are there any resources to learn more about Redoer? Um, so I think that's still from Jake's talk, uh, as I didn't work on the Redoer tool and neither did Julian. Okay, uh, okay, great. So um, does anyone has uh, more questions? Actually, um, I have a quick question if we have maybe a minute or two. 
Yeah, go on. So uh, this is this is great work, and I think uh, you know I I really love the idea of having these templates, and uh, uh, you know I think this is very much important if we want to have standards. So I'm kind of curious if you know uh, you'd mentioned that you're going to extend this to uh you know uh, more than just competent definitions but modules and experiments as well so I'm, I'm 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 a bit curious if the if if the idea is that there's like i mean do you have like a vision of having like two modes one is like these standard templates uh where folks can use excel sheets directly and then there's an underlying plugin that automatically converts to as well and then there's a developer mode or uh i'm just trying to understand like the roadmap for this going forward um, I think so as a first step, we want to uh, create uh, several templates, uh, which is for, I guess, uh, non-developer users. Um, but we have also hopefully with the, I guess, second hidden spreadsheet, which does all the uh, column processing, etc., cetera, uh, hopefully make it easier for developers to make their own templates as well, um, even if they don't want to contribute to the underlying com uh, converters. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, uh, we are going to move on to the uh, last uh, presentation of this uh, first block, um, which is titled uh, Towards Collaborative and Automated Development of, res of Resources for Data Standards in Synthetic Biology. Uh, uh, our next speaker will be Jake Ajibot. So um, he can uh, you can start any anytime you want. OK. Um, can you hear me and see my screen? Um, yeah. Okay, you so my me. name is Jake Sass, so Jake is not here. Um, I'll be presenting this talk. And the topic of my talk is about automating the development of resources using the synthetic biology open language. As you know, this standard has been developed to exchange genetic designs. I was traveling and I missed some of the previous talks, so I might uh, repeat some of the background information slightly. Apologies for this. First, a little bit about where I am based. So Keele University is somewhere in the middle of England between Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, it's campus-based, the campus is quite large. It's all green, very nice to walk around. It's like a little village basically with stuff houses, um, student accommodation, the science park and so on. And it's really always nice to see schools running around in the campus. Right, back to the talk. As you all know, SBO has two different components. The first one is about the data model, which allows us to describe genetic circuits in terms of their parts, how they are positioned together and so on. We can also add additional metadata, for example, interactions to say what's intended behavior of our genetic circuits. Obviously, by looking at machine level code, it's not easy to understand. We prefer diagrams, even when we draw them on a whiteboard, we try to pick up from standardized uh, rep representations of glyphs. So the second component of ESPO is, the, is about visualization to organize and systematize conventions about genetic circuit diagrams. So ESPO Visual uh, provides some standardized glyphs to represent entities, nucleic acid sequences, different molecular entities such as proteins, and also glyphs to represent relationships between those. By providing this, ESPO Visual makes things easy and as simple as possible by providing a framework in the form of some best practices. The default glyphs are black and white, but they are available as SVG files. So that means you can customize those SVG files yourself. For example, you can choose a different color. Currently, the information is available as free text. The spec includes a list of all SVG glyphs, how to use them in a PDF document. It's growing all the time. The latest spec is around 90 pages. It groups these glyphs into categories. For example, for each entity, uh, such as a sequence feature or let's say a protein, we have a glyph category. Each glyph category may have multiple recommended terms or alternative terms. And they are all uh, specified 
in markdown files. For each of these categories, we have a single markdown file. They are then combined together to create this PDF documents. Here you can see a simple one of those, Aptama, and there's only one recommended clip. Although I said there is a bit of free text usually, we also include some identifiers or numeric values from external ontologies. In this case, it says that if there is a data model using this sequence ontology term 31 in the uh, applications, it can easily be mapped to the Optima Clifton because we also use the same term here. Well, the standard is evolving fast. Since its early versions, we've been adding glyphs for sequence features, molecular species. Recently, we started adding interactions. Also, we incorporated the directions of these um, edges for participating entities. The community is also considering parametric glyphs nowadays. So these parametric glyphs allows you to specify different parameters such as size, color, and so on. All this activity is happening in GitHub, and we use a specific GitHub repository for Apple Visual. The advantage of GitHub is that it allows us to track history and provenance of changes so that we can see why something has been done, how and when. We even host these glyphs via GitHub using the HTTP access. Essentially, GitHub acts as a web server. We are really using GitHub to its extreme now. Even the ASPO standard website is hosted at GitHub and it makes things easier to integrate as well. When we make a new change, we usually implement in a separate branch. Once the branch is reviewed, it's then merged into a code base we then prepare a new release for all these glyphs. Well, although I mentioned that everything is being reviewed as much as possible, still incorporating community edited files can be error prone. And usually identifying errors is an asynchronous step by a bug report later on. It is desirable to somehow standardize these markdown files and validate them even before we try to make a release. Also, it's really desirable to create some sort of automated documentation like an HTML file, which includes all these terms and it can be easily browsed via the web perhaps. Although we make all these releases available as catalogs of clips um, to download as a zip file, for example, they do not follow the fair concept yet. So these glyphs are not searchable. They are free text. They are in a PDF file. They are not directly accessible for each version. Although we keep a master version, which is accessible through the web using GitHub, for different versions, we have branches that are not directly accessible. So to make things interoperable between different tools and to support previous versions and to reuse information, everything should really be machine accessible. Everything should be searchable. Glyphs should be resolvable. Also, the information about these glyphs and the asphalt data model should be integrated for better to support. Okay, so to facilitate this approach, we came up with a workflow approach. The idea is that it's automated as much as possible. Whenever there is a new release, even for a new glyph change, let's say we create this release, then this release is somehow automatically gets validated and is used to create a catalog that can be searched. At the same time, we also integrate information about ASPO3 data model so that the ASPO vision and data model parts are integrated. Because we are using identifiers from other ontologies, we also integrate all these external resources. We then auto generate the documentation for each version. Therefore, tools can start querying this catalog and they can use any of the versions. So that's the idea. And the information here can then be browsed using the web infrastructure. So when I say a catalog, we ended up creating an ontology. We previously built the second version, but now we incorporated the latest changes from the spec and we created the ESPO Visual Ontology version three now. This ontology is a machine accessible version of the ESPO Visual spec and it represents all the glyphs, how they are related and so on. It comes with a, with a base glyph term and now we have four main categories. These are also terms in the ontology. Sequence feature glyph to represent sequence features of these. The molecular species to represent proteins and other entities. Interaction glyph 
to represent binary interactions and interaction log glyph to represent interactions with multiple inputs and outputs. And each of these categories or main groups will have several different terms. And underneath, again, you will have uh, different recommended and alternative terms as well, depending on the context. So this ontology provides an abstract and simplified view of all ASPOL visual glyphs, it's great. And it also provides an explicit representation, explicit representation for the glyphs. Therefore, it's accessible for different tools to query the relationships between different terms. Here you can see a biopolymer location glyph, and there are three recommended glyphs, three alternative for each. And all the relationships between them are captured within the ontology and provides a shared understanding for software tools now. Okay, we then started updating the ASPOL data model ontology for version three. As you know, the latest version of ASPOL is fully graph-based. And in the new ontology, we started to reflect that. At the moment, it's quite basic, but it includes all the entities and how they are related, what kind of values they should have, what kind of restrictions can, they can have, and so on. And linking of the visual class data model specifications are to the component entities to represent things that can interact with others and also through the interaction entities basically to capture how they are interacting together. And we also use some raw properties and type properties which can have identifiers from external ontologies. That's how we use mappings for. I will come back to this in more detail soon. So if you look at the sequence feature glyphs, so this is the example for the optimal glyph, they're identified with as those component entities and with rows from the sequence ontology terms. So we have some axioms that they can be submitted to a description logic reasoner now to infer information. Most of the data from the markdown file is still available as annotations anyway. And we can start querying this ontology either using a reasoner or using a graph-based query language option such as Sparkle. Molecule species glyphs, these are for proteins, small molecules. And if you also want to represent DNA and RNA as molecules, then you can use those as well. They are also identified with as both component entities, but now they have types from the systems biology ontology. In this case, during the validation and auto creation of ontology, we enforce that all these terms uh, must come from the material entity STO term. If you look at the DNA term, which is a subclass of information molecule, which then derives from micromolecule, eventually this uh, micromolecule term derives from the material entity term. Therefore, the use of DNA uh, term is correct because it derives from the material entity. Similarly, we represent interactions. And in this case, we use as both interaction entities uh, to represent these uh, glyphs. Again, types come from SDO terms, but this time we use the occurring entity representation base term, which provides entities for biological activities, interactions, and so on. In this case, if you look at this example here, X inhibits Y, we suddenly start assigning roles to participating entities X and Y as well. We can infer that uh, the interaction has had Y and has tail X, and X has a role of inhibitor, and Y has a role of inhibited. And we can also use these terms in our queries data on. Similarly, interaction uh, node glyphs are quite um, the same, we used as for interaction entities to identify these glyphs. Um, and it can be used to represent interactions with multiple inputs and outputs. In that case, we specify the direction of edges using has incoming and has outgoing terms. Uh, for this disassociation glyph example, uh, you can see that the uh, Z molecule here entity has a role of reactant and others have a role of product using specific SPO terms. And they can all be used in queries, including annotations. Okay, so if you want to use a description logic-based uh, query, we can uh, write something like this. It's a glyph of some interaction to retrieve all the glyphs for interactions, or is glyph of some component to retrieve in glyphs for all interacting entities or we can start filtering those using raw properties and we can start using 
external identifiers from other ontologies. I won't go into the details of how to create this further, but the emphasis for the rest of the slides is for a web service, rather than writing low-level uh, search um, mechanisms. It developed a web service called Visual Ontology Web Service. So this web service acts as an image service. At the same time, it makes the terms accessible, resolvable, and searchable. It has four main uh, interfaces. The first one is an image service. It gives you an image straight away. The second one gives you how this image was found. It, it gives you some sort of provenance uh, information uh, and met some metadata. The third one is the opposite of trying to find the most suitable glyph for a term, but rather to say, what are the all, all the matching uh, glyphs for my particular term? And finally, the last one gives you uh, all the metadata for a specific as for visual term. So let's say um, we have this scenario. I use a specific sequence ontology term to annotate my genetic part definition. So how can I find the most suitable as for visual glyph then? Remember, sequence ontology has a few thousand terms and in as for visual, we have tens of glyphs. So from going from thousands of terms to tens of terms. If you use the terminator term one for one in your data model, then it's very easy because in the ASPO visual, we also use the same term. But let's say your data model use this RHO independent bacterial terminator and you use this 982 term. In that case, ASPO visual itself doesn't have any reference to this term at all. However, this web service integrates the ontologies anyway, and it infers all the relationships between different terms. And then it finds out that the closest term to find a glyph is the SO terminator term here, for which we have defined a glyph anyway. And if you use any of these terms or the terminator, the one for one term, one for one uh, terminator term, for all of these URLs, you still get the same terminator glyph. Okay, so let's look at our automation one more time. So we make a release. As soon as we make that release, we validate re uh, the release and auto-generate the visual, uh, as for visual ontology now. And we have different versions. Glyph files are cloned. All the markdown files are cloned and, and then we generate the ontology. Therefore, at any time, you can go back to any version without breaking your tool. And at the same time, we have this HTML documentation for each of these versions. Tools can still carry on querying the ontology if they want to, or they can use the ASPO Visual Web Service, for example, to use clips from the latest spec, or they can specify a specific version. So that's the automation workflow. How did we achieve this? Well, ASPO Visual is developed uh, using GitHub, as I mentioned, and it has a separate repository. As for Visual Ontology has its own separate GitHub repository. And then we use GitHub Actions. It's a special concept in GitHub. You can use GitHub Actions to define workflows. And our workflow scripts are split into repositories here. As soon as there's a new release in as for Visual repo, it triggers something in the second repo. As soon as the second workflow script is triggered, it does something remotely in the, within the GitHub environment. First, it prepares a deployment container. And then it sets up dependencies and libraries, downloads all the required libraries. It also downloads all the glyphs and markdown files from the latest spec or latest release that caused this trigger. It then runs a script to generate the ontology and the HTML documentation. It puts everything into a special folder. If the release is marked as stable, it then also replaces the default ontology. Otherwise, it will only keep a version folder. Once everything is executed, it will then commit the changes, all the new files back to the Apple Visual Ontology repo so that those files can be used by the web service. In that uh, uh, manner, the web service is quite dummy actually. It doesn't know anything about the versions or how many versions are there. 
or which one is the latest version. It just looks into a default location for the current um, or the last version of the ontology. In that case, tools do not need to specify a version and files will be down, uh, loaded from the GitHub remote repository remotely via HTTP. If the tools um, specify a version number, then that source will load the files from that version specific folder. At the same time, it also loads SO and SD ontologies from the GitHub repository via HTTP and integrates for each version so that you can run more intelligent queries. You can also browse different versions without specifying version number, or you can specify the version and then you can go through the documentation using the web. And it's also available through GitHub again. So the web service is mainly a, an image service, really. You can either use uh, terms from the Apple Visual Ontology, or you can use any of the other identifiers from external ontologies, or you can specify which version of the bill if you want, SVG, PNG, or PDF. And you can also specify different versions. And if you don't want to use the Apple Visual Ontology uh, GitHub repository, but if you have your own uh, Glyph file somewhere, you can also specify a custom location for the ontology and a custom base for the Glyph, and the web service will fetch the files from there as well. The mapping data is quite simple. Remember, it gives you some provenance. For example, if you use the RHO independent bacterial terminator in your data model, it will then say, well, it is the distance is two from the most suitable term. So it is the number of edges to get to the most suitable SO term for which uh, we can find a, a suitable bill. Um, the top-down querying is quite simple as well. Assume that you want to retrieve all the glyphs for all sequence features. In that case, you specify the very base SO term. Then it will map all the matching uh, terms and all the uh, glyphs for that. Or you can specify the SO visual term. In that case, remember, we, have, we may have multiple recommendations, uh, multiple alternative glyphs then you will see those as well, but you will be annotating all the results in terms of which one is recommended uh, and which one is alternative. You can also use the, again, a more specific SO or SPO term as well to get your um, glyphs. In summary, I think uh, the workflow seems to be working. We've been doing some tests and worked. Uh, we were able to automate a release and the web service could look at it. But we obviously we need to do more tests and verify all different cases as much as possible. And we should also start logging errors as well, rather than failing on errors. So we should double check everything. So this automated workflow really facilitates community-driven and collaborative development of the Apple Visual Standard more rapidly and efficiently, and we can identify errors more quickly. The web service is very lightweight for querying and retrieving most suitable glyphs and makes things um, findable, accessible as well. Automation has further potential to serve parametric SVGs for SPO visual design tools. And that's our possible next step to incorporate additional metadata for parametric SVGs so that we can return customized glyphs as well. Big thanks to Jake Sumner who worked on this project to automate different steps over the summer for three months. And he was funded by ASPO Industrial Consortium and many thanks for that as well. And also many thanks to our collaborators, James, Jake, Thomas, and Chris. Thanks for listening. Okay, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, does anyone have questions? Um, we have one question. Um, which end user tools does the ontology get used in? Well, we've just finished this automation and the web service is ready to use. It's directly accessible via the web. I've seen some web tools using this. 
Um, and if you want to use these resources, please let me know and I'm, I'm more than happy to help. But basically it's really suitable for web tools. I also have a library, custom library version. If you don't want to access to the web directly, I can package things up as a library as well. And you can use it independent, independent from the uh, web service access if you want to. Uh, okay, so thank you for the answer. Um, if there is no more questions, um, we are going to uh, now to a short break. And at 5 p.m., we're going to come back with a first keynote with Dr. Tiana Radivojevic. So um, uh, Brashan has already shared the link to the keynote. And we hope to see you there. <laughs>